Sure, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me and for the introduction. Um, I hope you guys are able to see my, um, like the full screen version of my slides. Um, and uh, so the work I'll be presenting today is, uh, is mostly what I had done as a part of the uh, Center for Music Technology uh, during my PhD research at Georgia Tech. Um, and uh, so, so the draft outline of the talk is going to be, I'll, I'll give a brief introduction about the motivation and, and, and some of the related work in this field. Uh, then I'll be covering two broad, slightly broader topics. The first one is going to be the latent space regularization, which is a method um, to regularize latent spaces in order to force disentanglement. Uh, and then I'll be presenting some experiments on music disentanglement um, that, that we conducted um, as a follow-up work to this. Okay, so so as as most of you already know, like over the last seven decades, um, we have been we have made great progress in the field of automatic music generation slash composition systems. So where we started with expert systems, starting from the Iliac suit by Hiller and Isaacson, which explicitly coded music composition rules to more probabilistic models, and more recently deep generative models, which have sort of emerged as the state of the art for several music generation tasks. Now. While most of these models perform pretty well, they suffer from a couple of challenges, which is uh, they typically work in a black box paradigm where they don't allow any kind of interaction or control over the generated music sequence. So it's mostly just a button press. You have a black box neural network model and then you get a full music sequence um, out as the output. So where we want to move towards is a more um, controllable generative model paradigm where the user can provide some sort of uh, a prompt, like either it could be either a generated music or a composed music, and then we provide the user with certain knobs or controls over different attributes of the music that they want to change, and then they get a, a prompt or, or, or ideas about uh, new generated music with those attributes changed. So this could basically make these tools more usable in, in real compositional settings. So to address these challenges regarding control and, and interactivity, I specifically look at latent representation based models where we are trying to compress high dimensional data into a low dimensional latent space and then try to decompress it back to the high dimensional data space. The idea is that during this decompression and compression, during this compression and decompression process, the latent representations can end up encoding certain hidden attributes of the data, which will be compact and could be useful uh, during the generation step. So one of the generative model which forms the basis of most of my research is the variational autoencoder. So I'd briefly like to introduce that just um, for consistency. So this model basically takes um, comprises of an encoder, which is a neural network. It maps uh, measures of music into a low dimensional latent space. And then there is a decoder, which is again, another neural network, which tries to reconstruct the measure of music back. So the model is trained to reconstruct its input using a reconstruction loss and a KL divergence, which forces the distribution of this latent space to follow, uh, to, to be mostly Gaussian-like. And, and during generation, we can just sample a latent vector and then pass it through the decoder in order to create new music, uh, musical measures. So latent spaces have shown some interesting properties such as semantic interpolation, where inter Interpolation along um, a linear interpolation along the latent space leads to smooth interpolation in the data space. So, for example, here we can show uh, in, in 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 this plot here uh, we interpolate between two different sketches by simply traversing a, a line connecting them uh, in the latent space. We also have this interesting property called as attribute vectors, where um, a simple vector operation can provide control over certain attributes. So, for instance. Um, given a latent space of, let's say, fonts, we can compute this bolding vector by using an average of the non-bold and bold fonts. So then consequently, we can increase the degree of boldness or decrease the degree of boldness of a given font by simply traversing along this bolding vector that we computed. Um, and these properties have been used in the context of music generation as well to manipulate musical attributes, such as the density of notes um, in, in a piece of generated music. Uh, so this was work done by um, Roberts et al. in their um, in their music BAE model. So while latent spaces are useful, they suffer from some limitations. First of all, there is low interpretability of the hidden attributes. So there is no 
uh, way to explicitly control which attributes end up getting encoded um, in which dimension of the latent space. And consequently, the latent representations might just be entangled where different attributes get jumbled up along different dimensions of the latent space. So there has been some research on like improving the interpretability of latent spaces. So one class of uh, these methods is, is unsupervised disentanglement learning, where we try to disentangle inherent factors of variation in a given data. So they so these these class of methods do not use any attribute specific labels, um, and they typically rely on modifications to the VA training scheme, such as forcing interdependence, uh, forcing independence between the latent dimensions. But um, like some prior research has shown that these are sensitive to inductive biases, such as the network architectures and the hyperparameter combinations. And, and we also observe the same thing in our experiments, which I'll be talking about later. Uh, the next set of methods is supervised learning methods. So the first class in, in those category of methods is what I call regularization-based methods, where we try to restructure the latent space so that uh, different dimensions or a set of dimensions encode a particular attribute. Um, a second class would be a uh, second subclass would be conditioning based methods where we try to learn like attribute invariant latent spaces. So the latent space itself is attribute invariant, but during the generation process, we can condition the decoder with certain attribute values in order to control the generation slightly better. Um, the limitations of these approaches are like some of these methods are limited to specific types of data, such as uh, they only work on like binary or categorical data attributes. And uh, they might also um, impose additional constraints, such as requiring differentiable computation of attributes. Uh, the third category of methods um, rely on learning transformations or traversals on top of existing latent spaces. So attribute vectors is a very simple approach to this, where we just travel along a, along a line um, in the latent space. But there are other um, more complex ap approaches, such as trying to learn um, a nonlinear uh, transformation on top of an existing latent space in order to create a new latent space where uh, things are more interpretable. But but a lot of these approaches are untested on music data and so far have only been or have only been used in the um, in the image domain. Um, also, like please please feel free to um, unmute yourself and and ask any questions if uh, during while I'm talking if if. Um, if you need to. Um, okay, so the two primary research questions that I try to address in my research is to what extent can specific musical attributes be encoded in the latent spaces of music generation models? And the second research question is to what degree can we disentangle different musical attributes in the latent space? So with this background, um, let's talk about latent space regularization. So the main motivation behind this approach is that we want to provide explicit control over individual data attributes by encoding specific attributes along specific dimensions of the latent space. So consider the figure here on the right, where during training, we want to encode thickness along thickness of this digit along the X axis and the slant along the Y axis. So, so that during inference, if we want to increase the thickness or increase the slant of a particular data point, we can do that by sampling latent vectors by traversing along these regularized dimensions. So that's that's the broad idea. And 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 to achieve this, um, basically we use this framework which which um, which I uh, uh, which I proposed, which was the attribute regularized uh, variational autoencoder or ARVA. So the method. Um, is, is fairly simple. The goal is to encode an attribute along a regularized dimension R, here shown in red, uh, so that the selected attribute um, increases as we traverse along this direction. So for instance, given two points, um, X1 and X2 here, where X2 has a higher thickness than X1, and if you are trying to encode thickness along this dimension, we need to enforce a training scheme where when we pass this these two data points through the VA encoder, the latent code for the second example should be higher than the latent code for the first example along this regularized dimension. So that's that's the broad idea behind the training scheme. So mathematically, we want the attribute value of xi to be greater than the attribute value of xj. Uh, if, if this condition is satisfied, then 
the latent code for the ith data point along the rth dimension uh, should be greater than the latent code for the jth data point along the rth dimension. So this is enforced using a batch dependent attribute regularization loss. So we compute this by taking a batch of examples and computing an attribute distance matrix, which is nothing but a simple difference between the attribute values, uh, pairwise difference between the, of the attribute values uh, for all the elements in my batch. Um, we then do a similar thing with um, the value of the regularized dimension, um, which we obtain by passing these data points through our BAE encoder. So we get a we, we get this matrix DR, which is of the same shape as DA. And then we compute the loss with respect to this attribute A and dimension R by taking the sign of DA um, and then computing its mean square error from the tan H of DR. Um, the delta parameter here is just a hyperparameter that we use to tune uh, the model. And, and we use a tan H here in order to make this loss function differentiable with respect to the encoder parameters so that we can use uh, gradient descent based optimization methods. Um, one thing to note is that list loss formulation does not impose any constraints on the way the attributes are obtained or computed. So theoretically, you could use um, some kind of computational method to estimate these attributes, or these attributes could be obtained from a user study or, or a human survey. So once we have computed this loss, we can compute a different loss term for each of the attribute that we, had, that we want to regularize and then add it to our overall VA objective, and then we try to minimize this entire uh, objective during training. So I'm gonna briefly talk about the experimental setup um, before I move on to the findings. So considering that this was a very, fairly general method, um, we tried to um, use data sets from both image and music domains in order to evaluate the potential. Of this method. So for, for images, we use two data sets. The first was uh, the D sprites data set, which comprises of uh, these kind of 2D shapes um, where our attributes are what kind of shape it, it is, if it's a heart, if it's a square, if it's a uh, ellipse, um, the scale or the size of this blob, white blob here, the orientation, which is the rotation, um, and then the position, the X and the Y position of this blob. Uh, the second data set that we considered was a Morpho MNIST data set, which is um, a data set of handwritten digits, but we have values for certain attributes like the area of the digit, the length, the thickness, uh, the slant value, the width, and the height. Uh, for music data sets, we considered two um, data sets of monophonic musical measures. The first was generated by taking the soprano uh, voice of the Bach chorals, and the, se the second data set was comprising of folk music in the Irish style. Um, single monophonic measures of music. And for both these data sets, we consider the following four attributes, which is the note density, that is the density of notes in a given measure, the pitch range, which is the difference between the lowest pitch and the highest pitch in that measure, uh, rhythmic complexity, um, and then a contour where uh, we try to measure if the overall melody is going up or down in pitch. So in order to compare ARVAE, we use two baseline models. One is the unsupervised beta VAE, uh, which does not use any kind of supervision. Uh, and the second is a supervised method, um, which, um, uses a, which uses a similar regularization loss, but a slightly different formulation than, than ours. Uh, so the first experiment we try to investigate um, is the degree of disentanglement and reconstruction that we get. So in order to do this, what we do is we take data points X from the held out test set and then pass it through the encoder to obtain our latent uh, representations. We then compute a disentanglement metric, which is the mutual information gap in this case. Um, simply stated, it measures the degree to which a single dimension in the latent space contains information about a given attribute, um, attribute A. And we then, we then average this metric across all the attributes um, for a particular data set. For reconstruction, we simply take these latent vectors that we had generated here and then pass them through the decoder to obtain the reconstruction and then compute the reconstruction accuracy. So in terms of results, um, you can see from the plot here that um, ARVA, which is shown in orange, uh, performs better than both baselines as far as the mutual information gap or disentanglement 
is concerned across all the four data sets, uh, which is both our image data sets and both our music data sets. So we are getting a latent space, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which has a higher degree of disentanglement. Unsurprisingly, supervised methods perform better than unsupervised methods, which is, which is expected, uh, because we are using attributes, specific information during training. Um, we also get pretty good reconstruction accuracy um, overall. Um, one thing that, that we did observe was that the reconstruction quality for specifically for images was improved compared to beta VAE. Beta VAE, which is shown in the bottom row here, tends to produce like blurry images, whereas ARVA, uh, the images were considerably sharper than, than, than beta VAE. So overall, we can see that we were able to achieve a high degree of disentanglement in the latent space while retaining good uh, reconstruction performance. The next thing that we wanted to investigate was um, the degree to which a method allows independent control over different attributes during generation. So for this, we computed this attribute change matrix. So the way this is computed is we, for each row that you see here corresponds to a regularized dimension that we traverse to, to generate a set of uh, data points. And then for this set of data points that is generated, we compute the degree to which these individual attributes change, and those are shown in the columns. So the, and, and, and darker colors indicate a higher degree of change. So the expectation here is that as we traverse along a particular regularized dimension, we should only see that particular attribute changing, and other attributes should remain the same. So effectively, we should get uh, a plot where we have like darker colors along the diagonals and and lighter colors along the off diagonal elements. So that's like an ideal model which which provides a high degree of control over the attributes. So what we see in our results is that um, for beta VAE, we, we get a highly entangled kitten space where traversing along different dimensions leads to simultaneous changes in, in several of these attributes. Um, the, contour, contribute, the contour attribute in particular changes a lot um, irrespective of what dimension we are traveling um, or traversing in while trying to generate the data points. For our supervised methods, both perform considerably better. So you can see this darker, um, significantly darker diagonal elements compared to the off-diagonal elements. Um, ARVA seems to be slightly better in this regard because for this contour um, dimension, the contour value changes considerably more than pitch range, whereas for S2VA, the pitch range seems to be changing more than contour, uh, which is slightly undesirable. Another interesting observation that we had was that for both these, uh, for both ARVA and S2VA, they were struggling to disentangle node density and rhythmic complexity during generation. Um, and this was this is clear in the plots here, where as we are traveling the dimensions regularizing rhythmic complexity and node density, we are actually changing both these attributes considerably. So. What we found out later was that this was an out, this was basically an artifact caused by the way we had defined rhythmic complexity, where rhythmic complexity had a high degree of correlation with the node density attribute. So that was that was basically causing this uh, causing this artifact. But overall, uh, like ARVA has was showing greater or better controllability during generation, which is which is what we which is what we wanted. Next, what we tried to visualize, uh, what we tried to do was to visualize the structure of the latent space with respect to the different attributes. So to do this, we used uh, these two plots. One is the distribution plot and the surface plot. So I'll talk about how these are generated. So for both of these plots, the regularized dimension for a particular attribute is shown along the x-axis, and the non-regularized dimension is shown along the y-axis. So for the distribution plots, we take a bunch of data from our held out test set and pass it through the encoder and plot it on this two-dimensional plane in the latent space uh, with the color showing the value of that particular attribute. Whereas for latent surface plot, we take a bunch of latent, uh, bunch of points from this two-dimensional plane in the latent space and then pass it through the decoder to generate new examples and then compute the attribute value. Um, so the expectation is here is that again, for an ideal model, we should see a smooth um, transition of color or change of attribute value as we traverse along the x-axis and relatively things should not change along the y-axis or the color should more, more or less remain the same. Um, and we can see, the, see that for, 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 for ARVA, that is the case. Data distribution plots uh, like show that there is a clear degree of disentanglement along the regularized dimension for these different attributes. And, and it, 
and it occurs for both uh, the MNIST data set as well as the folk music data set that we tried. Um, we can see the same thing from the, um, in the surface plots, um, where traversing along a regularized dimension change uh, leads to data points with increasing value of that particular attribute, whereas not a lot changes for that attribute value as we traverse along a randomly chosen non-regularized dimension. And we can see this in the interpolate in the generated interpolations as well. So the figure here shows different images generated by traversing along dimensions, which were regularizing these attributes. So we can see as we traverse along the dimension regularizing slant, the slant of the generated digit changes while retaining the rest of the attributes and also retaining the identity of the digit, which is nine in this case. Um, contrast that to beta VAE, where traversing along different dimensions, uh, where a particular dimension often leads to change in the digit identity itself, which is not desirable from the perspective of controllable generation. Uh, we saw the same thing with regards to like generated uh, music as well. So here I show piano rolls um, and the attribute values of these individual measures um, in the in the plot here, um, and we can see that there is a monotonic uh, relationship between the attribute values and uh, as we traverse along different regularized dimensions. Uh, contrast that to beta VAE again, where there is no clear relationship between the attribute values and traversals along these different dimensions. Um, so effectively, ARVA latent space was interpretable with respect to these attribute values. Um, and overall, we were able to show in this work that we could encode, explicitly encode low level musical attributes in the latent space using supervised learning methods. Um, and a high degree of disentanglement between musical attributes could be achieved, which can allow potentially greater controllability during generation. So, so after, after this, um, the next thing that I wanted to do specifically was to conduct a systematic study on music disentanglement specifically, because there were some, because if you recall this experiment here, where we, where we had attributes which were mutually correlated and that led to um, conflicting results, we wanted to conduct a more, more systematic study uh, of music disentanglement. So to, to once again reiterate, um, so what we are trying to do is we are going from high dimensional data to low dimensional representation and learn the underlying factors of variation. But a lot of these studies on disentanglement studies were mostly image-based and we did not have um, any um, consistent studies in the music domain at that time um, related to like disentanglement analysis or disentanglement study. So what we did was we, try to propose um, a data set, which was a simple data set in line with something like D sprites, for instance, uh, and we call it D melodies, uh, which was a very simple algorithmically generated music based data set with completely independent uh, factors of variation. So the core idea was to provide researchers um, a data set to, to try out disentanglement learning methods and do it and to be able to do it in a systematic manner, uh, so that they can compare their uh, work against others. Uh, so that we have a systematic and comparable evaluation. So the way we went about constructing this data set was we chose um, simple monophonic melodies of two bars, uh, which were played uh, using different scales. And to constrain the space of melodies even further, we use only arpeggios over the standard one, four, five, one cadence chord pattern. So we had 12 notes per melody and three per chord. So that we fixed that in order to constrain the data space and each bar plays two chords, uh, and the direction of the arpeggiation is, is varied. So with that in mind, we had this data set where we had these nine factors of variation, which was the tonic, um, the octave, from where we start playing the melody, the rhythm uh, corresponding to the first bar, rhythm corresponding to the second bar, um, the scale of the melody, uh, we had three options here, major, minor, and, 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 and blues. And then we had the arpeggiation direction of the, each of the four chords. So whether the chord was being played in an upward arpeggiation or a downward um, arpeggiation. So the resulting data set had almost um, 1.3 unique 
well, 1.3 million unique melodies. Um, and all of the factors of variation were completely independent from each other, which would allow us to do more um, systematic analysis. So, so I have like 10 more minutes. Is that, is that correct? Roughly? Yeah, okay. perfect. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, so, so to, to, to evaluate uh, different um, supervised and unsupervised uh, learning methods on this data set, um, we, we followed this experimental setup. So we used three different unsupervised um, learning algorithms and three different supervised learning algorithms, um, disentanglement uh, learning algorithms, uh, two different types of model architecture. Um, and we also compared uh, our performance uh, against the D-Sprites uh, CNN model just as a reference. Um, but most of the analysis was done on the D-Melodies data set. So the first experiment, again, similar to what we did for the latent regularization, we first tried to look at disentanglement and reconstruction. What we found out was that unsupervised methods did not generalize to this data set. So the mutual information gap performance uh, compared to D sprites um, was fairly low with these two, with the D melodies on the D melodies data set, irrespective of what kind of model architecture we chose. Um, and even the reconstruction performance was pretty poor. So we were not able to get the unsupervised learning algorithms to work with this data set effectively. Um, supervised learning methods performed comparatively better. So we were able to achieve a high degree of disentanglement shown by the uh, pink, green, and orange plots here corresponding to the supervised learning algorithms. Compare that to the beta VA method, which is shown in blue. Um, and we are also able to get a high degree of reconstruction um, accuracy while using the supervised uh, disentanglement learning regularization methods. So one conclusion from this was that unsupervised methods of disentanglement are probably not domain invariant because we were not able to train our train the DMLDs data set are using these methods. And supervised methods are, are better clearly for like forcing disentanglement if you know what attributes you are interested in. The second thing that we wanted to do was again, take a look at evaluating like controllability during generation. So similar to what we did in the previous um, slides that I, that I ran through, we computed this attribute change matrix. Again, the rows here shows a particular dimension in the latent space that we are traversing. And the column here shows uh, the degree of change in the attribute value. Once again, we expect darker colors along the diagonals and lighter colors along uh, the off-diagonal elements for, for an ideal model, which provides a high degree of control. Um, unsurprisingly, beta VAE performed like worst. There was no clear pattern in the change of different attribute values as we traversed along different dimensions. In contrast, uh, both IVA and S2VA performed pretty well with, with a clearly darker diagonal uh, color. ARVA did not perform as well, um, and it tended to struggle mostly with tonic um, and octave and scale. So those are the three attributes it struggled a lot with. Um, one of the reasons for that could be that the ARVA formulation is designed to work with mostly continuous data attributes, whereas the attributes in this D melodies data set were mostly categorical, and we had to basically tweak the algorithm a little, little bit in order to fit the ARVA um, regularization. And another interesting observation was that scale attribute, which is um, which we had three values for, major, minor, and blues, um, was difficult uh, to control across all the three models. Um, so this was, this was an interesting um, observation. Now, one thing that is interesting to note is that the experimental results on disentanglement that we saw before, there was not a clear difference between the performance of the three supervised learning methods as far as disentanglement was concerned in terms of the disentanglement metric, which was mutual information gap. But there is a clear difference when we try to look at the controllability that is afforded by these models. So one interesting conclusion was that a high degree of disentanglement does not necessarily lead to better controllability um, in, in, in these kinds of models. And in order to investigate this further, we again looked at the, we tried to visualize the latent space. So we looked at data distribution and surface plots um, using a similar experimental paradigm as, as, as earlier. So 
the data distribution plots where we project data points from taken from real data, um, like in this case, the DMelodies data and try to project it along um, in, in a two-dimensional plane in the latent space, we see that all these three methods are pretty good at separating out um, different attributes. Uh, note that these are categ categorical attributes and some of these um, algorithms, IAVA in particular, does not enforce any ordering of the attribute, uh, any particular ordering of the attributes, so you don't see a transition of color. Um, but you see, but you still see that there are clearly different regions here. But looking at the surface plots, uh, you can see that there are certain points which are shown by these white empty spaces where the generated data did not have a defined attribute value, which means that it was generating something which was either unseen in the data set or completely, completely bogus. Um, and, and these basically are, are holes in the latent space which where, where the decoder has no idea what to do. And, um, and, and these, these are basically locations where we have undefined attribute values. And we can see that when we try to look at the melodies that were generated, um, when we try to traverse along the dimension which was regularizing the arpeggiation direction for the third chord or the arpeggiation direction for the fourth chord, so you can see that some of these examples shown with the red boundary, the chord does not have a, like it does not have a up going arpeggiation or down going arpeggiation. It first goes down or up or something like that, which is which is undefined. Um, and and we, we had similar observations for, for other attributes also. Um, and all methods seem to struggle with the scale attribute. And the reason for that was even clearer when we look at the surface plots because we had holes in the surface plots for all these, uh, for this particular attribute, scale attribute for all these three methods. Um, and you can see that in the generated melodies also. So for instance, traversing along the regularized dimension for, for this particular IVAE model, um, we can see that we get some melodies which are not, which do not correspond to any of the scales that were present in the data set. Whereas for ARVAE, which is with, for which the plot is shown here, when we traverse along this particular line, we generate the same melody over and over, um, which is which is which is undesirable. So the simple conclusion there was that there are holes in the latent space which result in poor controllability in generation, and and we need to better define this and also uh, have a metric to to compute this uh, so that we know so we can evaluate controllable controllability of uh, generative models um, in a better way um, and basically disentanglement metrics themselves do not give the full power. That was the main um, main conclusion. So um, again, just to summarize, we were able to show that supervised learning methods can be used to encode um, categorical attributes along the different dimensions of latent space too. Um, and we basically were able to show some uh, initial studies to like uh, help propagate like conducting of systematic studies on music dis disentanglement learning. So before I conclude, um, I would just like to briefly talk about a few um, possible avenues for future work. Um, apart from, apart from uh, trying to improve the individual method, um, I think there are a few broad research directions which are, which are fairly interesting. Um, one is obviously improving interpolations in the latent space. So we, we saw that there was a clear dis disconnect between controllability versus disentanglement. Um, and the holes in the latent space seem to be the bottleneck. So one possible avenue for research here could be methods um, designed to like constrain um, or traverse latent manifolds in meaningful ways. Um, one thing that we didn't, the, all the three methods that we used for, um, for, for our experiments were methods which were regularizing the encoder of the VA and not the decoder. So I think that's, that's a, that's an area where where we need to focus a little bit where we also constrain the decoder in order to be able to map uh, like reduce the degree of holes um, in the latent space that we have and then another thing that we completely did not uh, include in our work was controlling higher level musical attributes uh, such as musical style tension or emotion so these these kind of musical attributes are like have longer time scales or evolve over longer time scales and they're highly subjective in nature so using supervised learning methods may not be ideal for these. Um, so I think 
that there has been some work on using semi-supervised uh, methods for encoding these kind of high-level attributes. So this could be like implicitly modeling these attributes um, or uh, reimagining these attributes as a composition of several low-level attributes. Um, and that is that those methods have shown some success, but there is still a lot of work uh, to be done to to encode and, con and, and, and be able to control like higher level attributes. Um, yeah, so, so with this, I think I would like to conclude my talk. Um, thank you for your attention and, and yeah, I will be happy to take any questions.